Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Church Leadership Lab. We get to have conversations that empower healthy churches. We love getting to do that, and we're really glad that you're with us today for another one of those. My name's Scott. I help host along with Casey, your other host. Casey, give the, give the people a good word today. <laughs> a good word. Um, <laughs> gosh, well, you know, today's Friday, so that's like a good word in and of itself, right? Yep, yep. Um, I, you and I were just talking before we hit record. So I will offer a word of humility. Uh, I recent, I was very sick over Christmas. So I went to my doctor trying to figure out the things and she's like running through the gamut and asked like any vision changes. And as I was just telling you, like, I find myself kind of like pulling my phone further, <laughs> further back. And I was like, yeah. well, you know, now that you mention it and she goes, um, honey, how, how old are you again? And I went, Oh no. I realized that like, Oh, you're trying to remind me that like, that's I'm aging. It's like, I yeah. don't really want to have that conversation. So, um, I was just telling you, like, I have this dull headache from squinting because yeah. I'm old, not sick. So, well, I appreciate I think, that. I, I think what you're trying to say is, and if you're like, no, that's not it at all. <laughs> is that our days, our days are numbered. Yeah. We have only a select amount that's and let's exactly use right. them as best, as best we can. Yep. So, um, avoid the optometrist and just pretend like I'm not <laughs> a number that starts with a four all of a sudden, yep. but Hey, anyway, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'm aging, but it's Friday and that's fine. That's right. It's We're fine. growing wiser and, uh, and that's a beautiful thing. Yep. Um, yep. Yep. Thank you. I, I like the positive spin on that, but Thank you. That's the, I feel like that's the value I bring to the podcast. Just keep it, Thank you. keep the arrow pointing up. <laughs> well, we're, we're really excited today to have a conversation uh, with James Whitford. Uh, James and his wife, Marsha, founded Water Gardens Ministries in Joplin, Missouri in 2000, and then founded the True Charity Initiative in 2012 to advance nationally the cause of privately funded effective charity at the most local levels. Now, his work has appeared in the Heritage Foundation's Index of Culture and Opportunity, uh, Patrick Henry's College Newsmaker Series, World, The Christian Post, and The Hill. And he and Marsha were honored to receive the World News Group Hope Award on behalf of Watered Gardens Ministries uh, in Washington, D.C. in 2019. Now, James received his doctorate from the University of Kansas Medical Center, and he and Marsha have five children who have flown the coop, leaving them a little bit more time uh, to fish the James River in southwest Missouri, where they live. James, thanks so much for coming on the show. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Great to be here. Great to be here. Casey, yeah. when you were talking, I was thinking of uh, the scripture in James that says, your, your life's just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. So, yeah. Well, I'm having a harder time seeing the vapor. Um, I just need to like, squint at it, but it's fine. It's fine. But we've just... We got to keep in mind, it's all going to be over pretty quickly. Exactly. So, and yeah. hey, listen, I, we, you and I are not far away. I'm in Tulsa and uh, oh. every summer I drive right through Joplin on my way to drop off my daughters at Canacuck. So next time I'm, like, I'm going to come over and like go fishing the river with you. I, I love all of that. You're in a beautiful Absolutely. area in the Ozark. So for those yes. that have not experienced this part of the country, they are missing out. There you go. Yeah, it is beautiful. Well, look us up next time you come through. Yeah. <laughs> Well, James, one thing uh, that we love to hear from the people who come on our show, uh, obviously we have the public bio that, that we shared, but there's always something that doesn't make that public bio that all your friends and family would know about you. So what would that be for you? Yeah, Scott, that's, well, that's like, there's a reason that other people don't know it, Scott. Yeah. <laughs> right. This is our no. way of getting close real fast. You know? Real fast. <laughs> Actually, actually, that's that's a tough question. Um, uh, I, I have a stupid human trick yes. that people oh, yeah. don't don't know about that uh, I learned in my days when I was practicing physical therapy and just had a little bit of downtime, you know, from time to time, and we would try some things. And so I learned how to stand on one of these balls right here. I'll show it to you. Oh my goodness! So this is a Swiss ball. And, you know, they're very bouncy and yeah. therapists use them for a lot of things. Anyway, I and one other therapist, we actually figured out how to stand on top of these. And yeah, uh, so awesome. it's a it's a unique, stupid human trick that people don't know. 
other than my family. Well, I, I think it's amazing. I know um, we have video here. Uh, for some people watching, I know some are listening. I'm not going to ask you to stand on it, but I will just say as somebody who's loved things like juggling and the circus and all of that, uh, that there's nothing uh, that, that actually sounds in, impressive and something uh, after we finish recording, I'll ask for advice on how I too can learn to stand on the box. I think that's awesome. <laughs> well, that sounds like it would take an enormous amount of core strength. So I'm also really, I have a lot of questions, but for those that didn't see it and are listening, you're, we weren't holding a small ball. That was like the large, like what, 26 inch or something like that, that like in the gym you, you use to do like sit-ups on, or, you know, I don't know. I don't know. It's like a yoga ball, but it's big. Yeah, that's right. It's a large ball. You, you would sit on one of these. Right. All right. Thank you. Maybe, maybe you would work on kneeling on one. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe. And then if you get really good, you stand on. I love, <laughs> so, it. Yeah, yeah. I love it. That's really impressive. Um, it, wasn't it Letterman that did stupid human tricks? Wasn't that on David I think Letterman? You're right. yeah, yeah. I think you're right. I yeah. remember yeah. staying up late and watching that with my dad, like, but stupid yeah. human tricks are perfect. <laughs> See now, Casey, you're revealing that your age starts. With I already four. did. I already did. James. <laughs> like, it's all just downhill from here. I'm 40 people. It's fine. But <laughs> that's what, that's what glasses and hair dye are for. So whatever, it's fine. All right, well, well, James, aside from stupid human tricks and aging ourselves, I would love to hear more about Watered Gardens and True Charity. Can you tell us where they came from, what's going on in those worlds today? Sure. Yeah. So my wife and I started this mission, Watered Gardens, in Joplin, southwest Missouri, in 2000. So it's been uh, been quite a quite a while ago. In fact, I had it. Oh, it's been about a year ago now that I was having doing orientation with a new employee at the mission. And I said, do you know the history of, of Watered Gardens? And she said, not a lot. And I said, well, do you know when we started Watered Gardens? Brand new employee. She'd just gotten out of college. Mm -hmm. And I said, do you know when we started? And she goes, well, I think it was before I was born. Oh, no. <laughs> and I mean, my, I literally was just like, Ouch. I could feel my heart kind of sink. And I was going, no way am I orienting yeah. a new employee who just got out of college who wasn't even born when my wife and I started this ministry, but wow. sure enough, it was true. <laughs> so, That's wow. a testament to your longevity, not our ages. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. There you go. <laughs> Looking for the silver lining. Always. But uh, it has been a great, it's been a great journey. Um, so it, it just give you a little, a quick history, bring you up to speed where we are today. First of all, Watered Gardens, the name was a mystery to many people initially. We would get calls from folks in the first year or two of our operation, uh, and they would be asking if we sold bird baths or garden equipment or did <laughs> landscaping. Or It's like, no, that's not what Watered Gardens is. Uh, and of course, it always gave us an opportunity to share the passage from which the name comes, which is Isaiah 58. And it is a passage where God is really chastising his people through the prophet Isaiah for going through the motions. They're, they're performing the religious rituals, but they're not actually, uh, as it says in verse six, choosing the fast uh, that God wants them to choose, which deals with dividing your bread with the hungry and sheltering the, the poor, clothing the naked. And there are a lot of promises in Isaiah 58, 6 through 12, beautiful promises uh, that are dependent upon our willingness to be obedient to, to God and, and, and help those who are in need. And one of them is you will be like a watered garden, mm -hmm. like a spring whose waters never fail. So beautiful passage intended for God's people. Uh, my wife and I had been serving apart from any sort of a, of a of a ministry name or a 501c3. That wasn't what it was about, but we had found I, what I would call the flourishing life on the other side of, of just giving ourselves away and helping people. And we thought, boy, we want the church to experience yeah. this. We really yeah. want to see the church um, flourish in that way, like a watered garden. So anyway, we named the ministry that, um, and, for the first few years, it was just kind of a redistribution center, basically. I mean, we would give a lot of stuff away. 
we loved people, but we certainly weren't seeing the outcomes that we had hoped to see and began to change our model of ministry. And we'll talk a little bit about that later, I think. Um, probably should dive into those details. But today, uh, you know, 24 years later, Watered Gardens is the largest privately funded uh, nonprofit that's dealing, working in the poverty space in, in the area. Wow. Nice. We have a family center for moms and kids experiencing homelessness, a shelter. Uh, an adult shelter for men and women. We have a respite unit for people coming out of the hospital. who mm. don't have anywhere to go to finish their recovery. Mm. We, um, we have a long-term residential recovery program for men. That's a 16 to 18 month commitment to character development and wow. work readiness. We have a worth shop. We call it a ministry mm. called the worth shop. Uh, we call it a worth shop because we've found that work awakens worth in people's lives. And so it's a ministry where people can craft goods to go to market in exchange for some of the basics that they need. And we can talk more about that kind of thing later as well. Uh, so the, the ministry has uh, grown quite a bit over the years. And, and uh, that's, so that's kind of the watered gardens uh, story in, in brief and very short. Um, our purpose is to serve the church and its mission to help the poor. Mm. So uh, we've always been, wanted to be a conduit and we've kind of structured ourselves that way, a conduit for the local church to be involved with people who are struggling with addiction, histories of abuse and trauma, uh, poverty, chronic homelessness. Uh, we don't want to be a parachurch organization that just hires a bunch of people to do the work that we feel God has mandated the church to do. Yeah. But so we, we really work to serve the church, both through equipping the church, but then also providing a place, a ministry where the church can be very active in serving. And last year we had more than 3000 volunteers from the church wow. who uh, came through to serve, whether it was, you know, in groups or maybe it's just an individual comes in every week and does breathalyzers during our shelter check-in. But we create a lot of positions for the church to be involved. And that's always been our heart. So uh, and then true charity grew out of watered gardens, uh, probably about, well, 2007, I think was really a big turn for us around that time. Uh, and I'll share this uh, quick story with you. I had been, uh, feeling like I was supposed to go live homeless on the streets. Wow. It was a very strange feeling. I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. I thought I was crazy. You know, you, you get that and you're like, and you just kind of shelve that thought. Yeah. And then I felt it again and I ignored it again. And then I, <laughs> the third time felt very compelled. And so I just went to my wife and I told her, which I always advise guys, if they feel like they're going to need to go live on the streets to proceed with caution as you go tell your wife. That Probably you're a good happy. plan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, to me, I just felt like she was going to say, Oh, okay. Well, that wasn't the response. I mean, yeah. it was, we have five kids. What are you thinking? Anyway, she said, I think God will tell me uh, when you're going to go live on the streets. Why that, woman? That, that kind of makes sense. But that very night we were reading a book, uh, crazy love by Francis Chan. Yeah. And there was like the chapter we opened up to to start reading was uh, a chapter that began about with a guy that went and voluntarily lived on the streets. And so Whoops. that was like this God moment. And the next day I, I left really not knowing how long I was going to be gone. Wow. You know, you walked everywhere. I'm, I'm, I'm out with people on the streets, you know, uh, uh, sleeping wherever. And it was just a couple of weeks that I, I did this, but, um, one of the nights that I was out, the sun was going down and I was with a guy named Ralph. Ralph was a guy probably about 30 years old. He had been chronically homeless. We had been working with Ralph at that point. We didn't have any shelter. There were no overnight services. It was just still a day outreach program. And, uh, Ralph had a Brown paper sack with a sandwich and it, and he offered me half of the sandwich, hmm. you know, it was cut in two. And he said, would you like half of my sandwich? And I remember that moment and feeling like I wanted to say, well, no, Ralph, I'm not going to eat your sandwich. I mean, I'm not going to take food from a homeless guy and I've got a place I could go back to if I need to get back to. But it was dusk. We're, we're on the street, basically the street corner together. 
uh, I had had nothing but a donut from that morning and I was hungry and I'm thankful I was because it, it uh, caused me to say yes. And I took half that sandwich from Ralph. But as we broke bread together that night, sitting on a curb, I realized that I had been treating Ralph uh, as an object of my good intentions mm. rather than a subject who has capacity to contribute. Mm. And, I, and I actually, we had been treating people like that for a long time. And so it just that was one moment that really was a sh- kind of shifted the way we began to think about the ministry. And wait a second. Should we stick people on the end of our good intentions? Should they just be recipients of our benevolence? Is there not a way to uh, enter into exchange or reciprocity with people that's more dignifying? All of these thoughts began to flow and read a book called Toxic Charity about that time, too. And I'll share more about that book probably in in a minute. But uh, all of that, we began to shift our model to where we were no longer going to be a handout giveaway ministry that just felt good about giving away as much as we could. Mm. And um, as we made those changes where we developed the worth shop, where people were going to earn things, and uh, we began to be more intentional about setting goals and and holding people accountable to the goals they agreed to to meet and these kinds of things. We saw an exodus. We were seeing about 4,000 people a year through our ministry doors. And and then suddenly that dropped off by about 2,800. We were going to round off a number. And so my wife and I, and at that point, an all-volunteer team, there were still no paid staff in 2007, and we were scratching our heads going, what do we do? And we realized that uh, though we were happy about changing the culture inside of our ministry walls, we needed to really change the culture of a community, Hmm. about how they thought about the human person, how they defined poverty. What does charity and effective charity mean? And so we began to do public service announcements on radio and television, billboards, uh, lunch and learns with leaders every month I would do. And just began to really try to flood our community with a different way of thinking about the poor. And some other communities heard about what we were doing. They wanted us to come and teach and do some day trainings and things like that. And, And the True Charity Initiative was born out of that. And that's cool. Uh, today, that's a national movement that uh, involves currently about 180 churches and nonprofits wow. across 30 states awesome. who have joined our True Charity Network and are kind of leaning into these ideas. So yeah. I'll stop there because uh, I know you guys have some questions. No, yeah. I love that. When you were saying, I'm going to go live on the street, my, my brain was like, for how long? Did, did Jesus tell you a, a length of time? And when you said, I didn't know for how long, I was like, oh my gosh, his wife. <laughs> you finished the <laughs> sentence. But when did you meet Ralph? You said like it was about two weeks. When did that conversation happen or that like, kind of an epiphany a little you bit? You know, I don't remember when it happened. Uh, I, just, I just remember the, that, the event yeah. in, that, uh, in that time frame. Um, and, and at the point we were, God had sent me out to pray, uh, for a shelter. So it was a type of a fast. Mm. And, um, so we had no overnight shelter services. There were oh. growing homeless problem in our <clears throat> community. And the, the miracle of the story, just cause uh, you guys will love this, but the, the very night that I felt like I could, I could walk back to my home, which was about. I don't know, five miles. And I thought, okay, I feel like suddenly I'm released. It was such yeah. a strange thing because I didn't know how long I was going to be on the streets. Until you and did. I walked back home. And then the next day, uh, my wife and I drove and I wasn't, I couldn't get in a car, couldn't drive anywhere. That was one of the deals. And so anyway, when, when we got back in the car the next morning and drove back to the mission where I had not used a phone or anything wow. during that time, and I got back to the mission and there was a voice message on uh, that had been left the evening before about the exact same time that I had felt a release to go home. And it was a donor that said he wanted to fund everything that was needed to, to do shelter. Wow. I mean, it was just so great. Yeah. So anyway, we began overnight shelter services at that point. I love yeah. it. That that's amazing. Um, you know, one of the one of the things you talked about was sort of the 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 work you're doing to help people understand. You know, it's not just the recipient of my benevolence or hey, I'm just gonna kind of 
give give resources here and then kind of done my part, but there, there's there's kind of more to it. One, one of the things I saw um, is a quote on your website from the tragedy of American compassion from uh, Marvin Olosky that says, dependency is merely slavery with a smiling mask. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I was wondering is if you could kind of unpack what is the problem of dependency and and kind of help people understand how that doesn't really attack the root and really provide a long term you know solution that people might be be hoping for yeah great book marvin olasky's tragedy of american compassion and uh that is a that's a line to remember mm-hmm. uh, dependency is merely slavery with a smiling mask Get you thinking a little bit, but uh, maybe a way to break that down a little bit more is just uh, to mention one of the things you would read in the book called Toxic Charity by Robert Lupton. And in in the book, uh, uh, the author delineates five steps to dependency. So he says, if you give something to somebody once, they'll appreciate you for it. Mm. But if you give the same thing, just a handout of one way to, to them again, the same thing, they'll anticipate that you're going to give it a third time. If you give the same thing yet a third time, they'll develop an expectation that you're going to give it a fourth time. Mm. If you give it a fourth time, they'll feel entitled to it. They may not know why, but you keep giving it. So they must be entitled to this somehow. And a fifth time they'll be dependent Mm. on you for it. So it's appreciation, anticipation, expectation, entitlement, dependency. So I think most of us who've been in the work of helping people struggling in poverty understand that trajectory that can that can happen. And um, and of course, it's not to say that there's not compassion behind the repetitive giving. But uh, but what we've got to do is we've got to look at outcomes. I mean, is our repetitive giving actually doing something or or is it not? And it's I think as Every person being made in the image of God. So that means we are made in the image of a creator, a great producer. Mm. So we too are intended to create and to produce. And I think right now in America, we have an enormous problem with a lot of stuff that's that's, that's reaching people who are struggling in need. And it's not ever really calling them to be a reflection Mm. of the image of God through creation and production and work. And uh, so as a result of that, I think we're alienating millions of Americans from Mm. uh, markets of exchange and real community that happens in the context of work. And I, in fact, I've been, I've been saying, and I believe it, that dependency today in America is a national epidemic. Mm -hmm. Uh, 37 million people in poverty. Statistically, 96% of them are dependent on some government program. And this, and that doesn't even mention the private charity problem. There's a lot of dependency happening in the sector of private charity as well, but 70s and then 70% of those folks, uh, as of right now, they, they're not expected to escape. So statistically, they won't escape this, which means that you have about 24 and a half million Americans on a trajectory to die in dependent poverty. Wow. wow. So we have a big problem with dependency. And a lot of it has to do with us not understanding that the human person is intended to create, to do, to produce, and that our charity should not drown that out. We do people a disservice mm-hmm. if we, in our, with our good intentions, you know, flood them with everything that they need or want without uh, calling them to be a participant in that. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, it's, it's an issue of, of human dignity, in our opinion. Yeah. And I mean, how could you ever feel like you can escape when you are dependent? Like, I, it's obviously not the same thing, but I think like after a major surgery and like you're kind of in bed and dependent on someone to help you do everything. You are dependent. I I can, I'm physically unable to care for myself until I am able to, but there's a path to that is recovery. If what you're talking about, there is no path to recovery. How could I ever expect to Mm -hmm. escape this? Uh, It's not a healing process. I'm kind of trapped in this like, you know, air quote, unproductive member of society that can't feel good. And yeah. No, no. 
Yeah, I think you're keying in on something very important with the idea of <clears throat> learned helplessness. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it's a it's an old study, but it was uh, moved into the realm of human psychology. And uh, but but we, we see that 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 basically where you become you feel like you're trapped and there's no escape. And a lot of that has to do with the lack of empowering people. Yeah with choice yes. and being able to, and, and if, if we're providing everything you need, then you're not weighing out even basic daily economic decisions. Right. You're, not, you're not exercising your free will to choose. You're not being empowered. And so you learn to be right there. You learn helplessness and don't realize that there is a way of escape. We have met countless people yeah. who have been right there. Mm. Yeah. Well, you're leading right into this and Everything that you guys are doing, all this work at the beginning, we mentioned all the different programs. Those sound like not quick and easy solutions, but very long. To you. One of them, I think you said was 16 to 18 months learning skills, learning trades. That's not a band aid. So, kind of taking that back into the modern church for a second, um, what are some of the common ways that you see the church really, really um, exercising with good intention? but perhaps doing more harm than good specifically with serving um, in poverty or underprivileged communities? Well, I mean, every church has different types of programs to help people. Um, I think one is the uh, kind of a typical benevolence fund. Mm -hmm. And so folks might need help with, um, you know, a utility bill or, some, you know, partial rent payment, something like that. And so, is there money in the fund? If there is, we'll write you a check. Sometimes that's also dependent on how, like if they've not been there before. Right. Right. So, mm. or, or it's dependent on the frequency. And, but I think that the church has got to go beyond that mm -hmm. and uh, do more investigative charity work to really get to know the person and what's going on. And then again, uh, you know, for us, a church can send anybody down to our worth shop. Mm -hmm. to uh, have a little skin in the game. Yeah. Are, are you are you willing to be a part of the solution? Because if you're not willing, then mm -hmm. how is 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 what we give to you going to be a help? Yeah. It won't be. If you're not willing, then it won't be a help. And so the question is, how do we test if you're willing? Yeah. That's what the church needs to do. The church has got to figure that out. I had one Presbyterian pastor friend in the community. He's since moved into Arizona. But he always had chores around the church. He loved our philosophy. Mm. And people would come to the church and they need help with this, that. And he would he would have something that yeah. they could do around the church before he was going to simply cut a check. So I think we need to do more investigative work. And I think that we need to uh, engage in partnership with people. Mm -hmm. Again, separate the us and them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's get rid of that and let them become partners in ministry and the work of what's going on around the church. Food pantries is another one uh, that the church is very involved in. C could we not take our food pantry and turn it into a food co-op mm -hmm. where you've got cooperative uh, you know, activity, contribution from the recipients. Yeah. And again, yeah. enter into that kind of exchange that's so important and so dignifying to people. Right. So I think that that's another, another thing that the church could really think about doing. You're yeah. kind of talking about the difference between immediate relief versus long-term restoration. Like we, we're so quick to just like jump to relief, relief, relief when there's an opportunity or maybe a missed opportunity to be like, let me actually be part of a restoration mm -hmm restoring that dignity, that skin in the game. Hey, let me help you help yourself. It takes a lot more time and intentionality, but um, I don't know why that relief solves an immediate need, but restoration like helps you not be dependent. I like that you've called you, that out. You're so, yeah, you're so right. I, that's, I mean, we could talk a lot on that. It's, it, you know, you read When Helping Hurts, great book. Yeah. Uh, and they talk about relief and rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. And development. Yeah. And so you, we need to be a little more investigative to find out, is this person really in need of relief? Sure. It's a crisis. It's a, it's a unique moment. It's, it's a house fire. Something's happened and we just need to give Show you up. whatever you need right. for the moment. Uh, but when we do that again and again, we are no longer uh, practicing good charity. Mm -hmm. That is relief. Yeah. It needs to move to rehabilitation and development, which always requires effort 
mm-hmm. on the part of the recipient. That's yeah. always going to be a part of that. And so you're exactly right, Casey. Yeah. You know, you mentioned um, just a little bit ago kind of about um, about partners and, and partnering and partnerships. And one of the things it, it, I think it brings up is, you know, obviously the church certainly has a role to play when it comes to serving the poor, when it comes to fighting poverty. Absolutely. Um, and there's there's things that that I think every church can do. But sometimes um, it's it's more effective to partner with organizations already doing great work. Um, and so how can churches find those organizations, their community, partner with people already serving their community? And how can they be really good partners as well in that relationship? Right. Yeah. So um, my first thought on that would be go talk to somebody who's poor Mm. or maybe homeless and, and just get to know them yeah. because they're going to know the organizations in the community yeah. that are doing things. I mean, that's what I would do. I'm not going to go to the yellow pages. I'm not going to, I mean, I'm going to go to, uh, to talk with somebody who's in need because they're going to be very familiar with the system of mm. benevolence in a city. Mm. And I mean, that'd be a great uh, kind of a scouting mission by, by a church. Hey, we're going to go talk to a dozen people yep. over this week and come back and report on what did we learn from the individual? How are they really helped? What organizations are helping them? Uh, and get kind of, uh, you know, get their feedback on that. So I think, um, I think that's probably what, what I would do. What was the second part of your question though, Scott? Well, I'm, I'm curious how then as they establish those relationships and, and obviously I'm I'm assuming you've had those yourself count, you know, given some, some wisdom and advice, how can churches then actually be really good partners? Yeah. Well, more than, more than just through funding. Mm. So of course, you know, uh, the, the brick and mortar ministries of watered gardens, are privately funded and and almost, you know, most of it's coming through the church. And so we're really thankful for that. But we're also very cognizant there's a tie between where financial resource is coming from and and volunteer resource. Yeah. And so I really think that the church has got to be willing to to be there, uh, to volunteer and to understand that uh, their presence and involvement is not it's not a is not a sidelight. Yeah. It's, it's the main light. It's the main, it's the main thing because the church carries the gospel of Jesus Christ, yeah. which is the answer for the plight of man today. And so the church is going to have to be involved. And I also think, uh, it would be good to get educated. Mm-hmm. And so we, we offer a lot of educational resources, but to get educated about, uh, how to do charity better and, um, and, and, and be relational. Yeah. Because a lot of times I think we show up and we think, okay, well, you know, James on a podcast said, go be a volunteer. <laughs> so I, I signed up to do a meal thing. So I'm going to go serve meals. Yeah. Well, that's great. But it's, it's obvious, you know, when you look at Isaiah 58, 10, where God says, if you'll extend your soul or if you'll give your life to the hungry, mm-hmm. then you'll be like a watered garden. I mean, mm-hmm. so he, he wants us to do more than serve a plate across a line. Yeah. Yeah. And I, those are activities that are not bad, uh, but we've got to make sure they're coupled with building real relationships with people. Mm-hmm. And I'm convinced if we want to you know, talk about spiritual battle, I think that the enemy has erected a tremendous amount of his, uh, his force toward stopping that. And, yeah. and I think, I, honestly, I don't think he cares if you show up and serve a million meals at Christmas times or Thanksgiving times, when I just don't think he cares. He's going to care when you sit down at the table mm-hmm. and you begin to eat with folks yeah. who you just served a meal to, and you begin to get to know them and love them. Yeah. When, when that type of relationship begins to develop, we're going to make a real impact. Yeah. I love that. I, I, there are so many churches that, that get this right, but I think when, when we naturally think about missions, we, for some reason, jump to global missions and sending money overseas. And I, I always want to be like, what are we doing right here? Like literally in our, in our own communities, who do we partner with? Um, like just right here in my community, there's literacy partners and uh, local farms and these things. Like I know exactly in my neighborhood, 
we absolutely support global missions as well, but I can like know in my, you know, within my five block radius who we partner with. And that feels a little bit more, and maybe that's just me. I don't know. I'm kind of a hippie, but like, like that's like a little bit more of the, like, I can see this and I can be like tangibly part of something, not that overseas is not important. Like, please hear my heart on that. But I, I love that you guys are literally being like the hands and feet of Jesus in your community. Um, there's something really, really powerful. That's a lot harder. Again, it's a lot harder to sit down and be like, tell me, who are you? What's your story? Cause you're just a human being in my neighborhood, just like I am. Mm-hmm. But it's a little bit easier to go online and drop a donation to something that I don't actually get to see. I yeah. know it's valuable, but that takes a little bit less um, effort perhaps, or maybe a little yeah. bit less humanity. I can mm-hmm. give, yeah. but am I serving? There's a, there's a little bit of a difference there and it's, Harder. Yeah. No, that's so good. You're you're keying in on uh, our vision statement for true charity, mm-hmm. which uh, is not something that is publicized that much because it's kind of an odd vision statement. But it is uh, to see subsidiarity mm-hmm. as the norm nationwide. Mm-hmm. And subsidiarity really comes out of Catholic social teaching, but the principle is beautiful and biblical, yeah. and uh, it is it has to do with. Uh, uh, concentric layers of help like what's who's the closest Mm -hmm. to the person that ought to be involved before we in our foreign missions jump in and do something more paternalistically uh and so that's that's really what that's all about there's a great uh when it when it was framed up um it was in a a quadragesimo anno it's uh, pope Pius in 1931 and he says something very close to this he says Uh, It is a disturbance of right order to take from an individual what he's able to accomplish through his own industry and initiative and give it to the community. Mm -hmm. Just as it is a disturbance of right order and a grave evil to give to a larger association what a lesser subordinate organization is able to do. So you, you can see how he's layering that. He's like, what can the person do him or herself? And, and is the family involved before you have, you know, the city mission involved? Yeah. And is, is the city mission involved before you have the government involved? And so, but I really believe that if we will uh, respect that principle of subsidiarity and how we're helping people, if, if we did that as a nation, it would change everything. Mm-hmm. The isolation that we see that's so, that really is an epidemic. I, I know our Surgeon General recently said this, and I agree. Yeah. Uh, the isolation that we see would be solved and be solved to the, to a great extent. If we would just respect that, but instead yeah. we have forms of charity, both public and private that jump in to rescue the individual without ever making serious consideration of who's closest to that individual that knows best and can, it should be actually has the responsibility to help that individual. Yeah. So we've got to layer that correctly. That's beautiful. Well, uh, subsidiarity is the word of the week that I'm going to try to learn and spell the next time I play Scrabble. But um, gosh, I could just keep talking to you for hours. This is so good. And what a a kind of a perfect place for us to bring it all together. Um, James, we ask everybody the same question. So I'd love to kind of bring it home to you with from where you guys sit, what is one essential component of a healthy church? Oh, I think... um... An essential component. This might be a little bit more of a sign than That's a component. Fair. We'll allow it. it works. <laughs> to, to, yeah, to me, a healthy sign would be a socioeconomically diverse church body. Mm. Mm. See, the gospel is uh, applicable to the heart of man, regardless of whether you're rich or poor. Yeah. And so I think that where the gospel is preached, there should be a desire among the church and its leadership to bring together those who have and those who don't so that real relationships can be developed uh, between them. Yeah. 
Wow. That is, uh, yeah, that's well said. And I think that that highlights too maybe the goal for some of the church leaders listening as they dive into partnering with people in their community and, and, and going to work themselves, you know, to fight against uh, and poverty and to see human flourishing. And so, so appreciate you sharing that. Now we, we do have kind of a closing section of our podcast. We do, it's called the final five. It's a little more, um, uh, fast paced. And so we're going to jump into that if we can. The first one I'll ask is, and I know we, we mentioned a handful of books this episode already, so you can either repeat one or add a new one, but what is one book that you'd recommend to church leaders? Well, I, I do think tragedy of American compassion is a great, great read. Uh, it's interesting. The one that comes first to mind though, is kind of, uh, it's called is Caesar our savior. Oh. Ooh. So it's by Eric Laverance, L-A-V-E-R-E-N-T-Z. But Eric Laverance is Caesar, our savior. Mm. Um, so it's a great it's a great charge to the church to pick up the mandate that God has uh, has given her. But uh, the tragedy of American nice. compassion, toxic charity, when helping hurts. Those are all great books, yeah. too. So Some, sometimes I hear book titles and I'm like the title alone just like gave me some life, you know, and that, yeah. that's one, yeah. what a great title is Caesar, our savior. We're going to make sure we, to link to that. Scott, we both went, Ooh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. That yeah. That's great. I know. Like by title alone, I didn't tell me more, but yeah. <laughs> all right, James, this one is super lighthearted and you have to be honest. If this is a confession moment for you, that's fine. But what is the last thing that you listened to like Spotify or Apple music, whatever you, whatever you listen to? Yeah. So I don't even, I, I'm not on Spotify or Apple music, but I, I, I do listen to uh, like the most recent thing I would have listened to would have been uh, American history tellers. Ooh. Okay. So it's a podcast called American history tellers. And they do a fantastic job and you learn so much in an entertaining way. So my history awesome. teacher brother would be like high fiving you right now. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. It's uh, good. What is your favorite piece of technology? And we usually give the caveat to not say a phone because it's an amazing technology, but we need that one off. Well, the I tell you, one of the things I've learned in you know, running a national initiative and a gospel rescue mission, right? So there's a lot going on. And when I'm on the move, I got to tell you, it's really nice to be able to uh, answer a phone call from my Apple watch. That is nice. And so yes, I pay the extra $10 a month, but I'm able to pick up a call right on my watch and the audio is good. Yeah. And so that is incredibly helpful for me sometimes to be able to do that. I <laughs> bet. Not wrong. I answered a call from my Apple Watch while installing my Christmas lights on a ladder. It's like, yep. this is probably not a good idea, but I love that I can do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I support you. All right, James, number four, you're almost done. Is there a quote, a piece of wisdom, something that has just really stuck with you throughout the years? Oh, I, I would say that um, I was, I was, uh, yeah, in St. Louis at one point, and uh, and, it, and an advisor had said he, he was listening to the busyness of, of life, all the things that I was involved in, kind of coaching, and he said, you know, you need to shift from time management to time budgeting mm. because you have too much stuff. You're going to be able to. It's not a matter of managing things; it's a matter of budgeting your day to to various activities. And that was really helpful advice. I've put that into to play. So there are certain times of my day are committed to certain things, and trusting God with with all the rest of it. I like it. Yeah, I love it. All right, last one. What's one thing you'd like to communicate to our audience of church leaders? I think uh, it would go back to this idea of relationships and the importance of building relationships with people. Um, a guy that runs a, a, a mission up near uh, Pine Ridge, South Dakota. He's actually in White Clay, Nebraska, just a few miles south of the reservation, uh, the Native American reservation for Lakota, the Lakota uh, people there. And I was with Bruce in a truck one day and he said, James, I'm so tired of people coming and doing for the Lakota people. I want them to come and be with mm -hmm. the Lakota people. So he's invested his life, but he sees those mission trips coming all the time. And it made me think we need to, the, we, the church, we need to change our thinking away from long distance, short-term mission trips mm -hmm. 
to short distance, long-term relationships. That's mm-hmm. so good. And I, I really think that's uh, the thing that I would want to communicate. That's awesome. Well, James, thanks so much for being with us today. One thing I'd love uh, if you could do, could you just give our listeners some um, some kind of steps they can take where they can go to learn more about what you're doing, learn what your charity is doing, connect with you, uh, potentially partner with you all? Could you just kind of lay that out for folks so they know uh, the action they can take? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, like I mentioned earlier, uh, our heart from the very beginning has been to serve the church. That That hasn't stopped. True charity has uh, grown, uh, you know, in in a different direction than the brick and mortar ministries of Water Gardens as a national movement. But at its core is still the same. We want to serve. And so uh, we have created model action plans and toolkits that can help churches transform the way they're doing their food pantries or their benevolence programs or just learn more about mental health issues that are going on. So. Uh, we're very excited to be serving 180 plus churches and nonprofits across the nation with real practical things that help bridge the ideas that you and I've been talking about into something that can bring real solutions to the people that they, they love and serve. And so we want to do more of that. And I think any church leader that has an interest in really helping the poor should go to truecharity.us. So truecharity.us is the True Charity website. You'll see uh, tabs there for how to become a member. Uh, you'll see, uh, you know, some of our articles that we've written there. You're going to find out all uh, about True Charity and our work. But we certainly believe with all of our heart that we've got to transform the way that charity is being practiced in the United States. We think the church should be leading on that front, and we want to serve her to do it well. Mm. Well, that's a, yeah, that's a, a great kind of bow to put in a, a way to kind of put a period on the, the conversation that we've had. We so appreciate you sharing what you've learned, what you've, um, obviously what, what you all have built, what God has done, um, but also the wisdom and really the perspective that you have on how church leaders can move forward in uh, living out the biblical mandate to serve the poor, to love uh, those uh, around us who are our neighbors, really, um, ultimately, and and to see them flourish. And so thank you for your time uh, today. And thank you for those of you listening, watching. We hope this has been helpful and fruitful for you. If it has, we'd, we'd love to invite you to share it with somebody, to sub- subscribe, uh, leave a comment, let us know what you thought, leave a review, all of those things. Not only will it help other church leaders, but it helps us get this converse, these conversations uh, into more ears. So we would appreciate that. And we are looking forward to more conversations uh, to come, all with the goal of empowering healthy churches. We'll see you next time. This episode of the Church Leadership Lab podcast is brought to you by Ministry Brands, the largest provider of church technology software. Over 90,000 churches rely on Ministry Brands for their single platform solution that brings together all the digital tools a church needs. From online giving to websites to church management software and more, Ministry Brands is leading the way in simple to use, innovative solutions, all with the goal of empowering healthy churches. To learn more, visit ministrybrands.com.